heavy. Board. Cities of the Plain, the third book in Cormac McCarthy's Border Trilogy, is a novel I didn't plan on doing for the podcast, especially since I hadn't prepared to do the entire trilogy. But then, Cormac McCarthy died just a few weeks ago, and I suddenly felt obligated in some way to do it. I kept seeing articles defaming McCarthy's legacy and his work in all these different ways. And while that may have more to do with my algorithm, listeners, I couldn't stand to see it. I've even gone as far as to contemplate reading Blood Meridian on the next podcast, just to put my own two cents into the void. And while I saw plenty of praise and well-written obituaries from almost every American publication on Earth, I thought none of them really captured what McCarthy was best at. So much obsession with the violence in his books, the killing, the brutality, to a point I found most of the obsession over his violence incredibly boring. I had already heard all the arguments. One can only pretend to be offended by violence in written form so long before I start to yawn. There is nothing interesting left to be said about any given individual's offense at violent material, even if they are fictional. It's all been said before, and it's all just as boring and just as stupid as ever. But here we are. I had never read Cities of the Plain before now, and I really had no expectations. Other than my previous praise for McCarthy and his work, I am not the type to look up plot beforehand, and it isn't because I hate spoilers or anything like that, listeners. It's because I like to let the work wash over me, take it all in, with no one else's thoughts in my head. And yes, even looking up a Wikipedia plot summary, which someone else wrote, ruins that purity in some way or I think, at least, because even that summary will have someone else's interpretation on it, even if small, subtle. It can't be helped. We are all only human. So, I like to go into a novel for the first time without looking anything up if I can help it. And so I did here. First published in 1998, this last installment of McCarthy's Border Trilogy is what I would call one of his lesser works, as I referred to in a previous episode. And let it be known, I am not saying it's a bad novel. It is still solid in all the ways a reader can come to expect a novel to be for McCarthy. And of course, we are still talking Cormac McCarthy here. The bar is high, listeners. Even his worst novels are above average, so let's just get that straight before we move on. But Cities of the Plain struck me as a very peculiar novel in McCarthy's body of work. It is one that doesn't quite seem like the others to me. And maybe that's just because we've seen the main characters before. John Grady Cole from All the Pretty Horses and Billy Parham from The Crossing the first and second novels that make up this border trilogy. But it did strike me as rather meandering at times, particularly the first 150 pages or so. The story really didn't get going until we learned the stakes of John Grady wanting to marry a prostitute from over the border in Mexico at a whorehouse. And we first see John Grady and Billy together as ranch hands, training horses and driving cattle in Texas, about three years or so after the events of The Crossing. Billy smokes now, as everyone did back then, and they both live as men who roam still, though they happen to have settled on one particular ranch. And there is something to seeing these two characters united at last in this novel. But, I have to admit, listeners, it did fall a little short for me. Firstly, the novel joins Billy and John Grady together, but the story is still mainly about John Grady. He's the only one that gets any type of plot around him 
Billy, in this novel, could have honestly been anyone. Another ranch hand he had befriended. And that isn't so bad, really. As I said, the novel is still above average. But it did make me think this novel in the trilogy maybe didn't need to be written. That it doesn't carry the same punch of the previous two books in the trilogy. But, let's be fair, let's think of this as creators and critics, that maybe McCarthy just couldn't give up the characters. That he had to write them one last time before he could move on. And of course, that's perfectly normal. To be expected, even. A writer in love with their characters is hardly new. But it did seem to be a little bit of spinning tires as far as story goes. And, of course, yes, story or plot, as some like to say, isn't everything. But McCarthy's novels usually give high stakes. And this one does, eventually. But it does take about 200 pages to get there. The main issue is John Grady's story is the same story, more or less, as the first novel in the trilogy. In its simplest terms, John Grady is in love with a woman he can't have. In this case, a Mexican prostitute. And as much as it pains me to say it, Billy seems to only be there to tie in the previous novel, The Crossing. Which is what makes me wonder if McCarthy was under contract to complete the trilogy. But of course, I don't know. It could well have been. It might just as well have not been. It could have been just another step in the process of writing. This never-ending arc we talk about on this podcast constantly. The writer. The craft of writing. Following that gut instinct. I have no doubt McCarthy was always following his. But Billy's main function in the novel is to bring up moments of the previous two. A nice little tie-in, but it is noticeable that Cities of the Plain is the only novel in the trilogy that references the previous two books. Sure, all the pretty horses had nothing to reference, but The Crossing did, and there is no mention of John Grady in The Crossing or any reference to his story. What I'm trying to say is, while compelling and masterfully written in parts, it did seem that this was sort of the afterbirth of the previous two novels. The leftovers. Lukewarm on the plate. And hey, McCarthy can afford to have a few lesser novels. No one can write a perfect, sweeping saga every time. And unfortunately, Cities of the Plain happens to be one of those. And until we do learn about John Grady's infatuation with a Mexican prostitute, the novel itself tends to drag. Sure, McCarthy isn't exactly known for his fast-paced novels, but it did meander a little more than usual, at least compared to the previous two novels in the trilogy. Really, the thing that most compelled me reading through the first 150 pages or so was the actual references to the previous stories. It's still interesting from a technical perspective, as I've already stated in previous episodes. McCarthy's prose is always worth the read. And it was here too, listeners. But the novel, as a whole, is perhaps the weakest of his I've read. And I did consider why I felt this way. And I thought about how maybe it's because there is no coming-of-age story in this novel. That part has already happened in the trilogy for both characters. This is just two men. One learning from his past mistakes. Another repeating them. It's very realistic, as McCarthy always is. But it did seem that this one focused more on love, women, manhood, than the previous two novels. And that makes sense. The boys have matured, though he still refers to John Grady and Billy as boys in descriptions, even if they are well into their 20s now. But what that does is make the novel feel less graceful than the previous two in the trilogy. And yes, I'm comparing them to things other than the actual novel in front of me, but they are connected stories, listeners, as a trilogy implies. 
But this third installment also seems to use less literary devices. There are less characters exchanging wisdom, though there are still many, and there are no dreams, no foreshadowing in the way the previous books did. The foreshadowing for not getting what one wants is literally stated flat out in this novel. Unusually ungraceful for McCarthy. Just less elegance than what I am used to when reading a typical Cormac McCarthy novel. And this may irritate some listeners, but I feel this is true for the epilogue in this novel, too. Where we see Billy at around age 70, still wandering the roads and hills of Texas. And again, it pains me to say, it seems forced. It read as forced to me that this final chapter the last we see of Billy, is somehow tacked on the end, that maybe we didn't need to see it. And I think it shows that Billy might not have really fit into this story that well, as it's mostly John Grady's story. The fact that the novel ends before we get Billy's final years in a very brief glimpse, and it's a long interaction about dreams and so forth, reality, again, seems as if it is trying to tie in the beautiful literary devices of the previous novel into this one, but waiting until after the novel ends to do it. And it struck me as a desperate attempt to do it, really. Overdone and, quite frankly, overwritten, <clears throat> at least the final chapter, which makes it overemphasized, and it almost takes away from the tragedy of John Grady at the end of the novel, which is really the most powerful part, that final scene of Billy and John Grady, I couldn't help but think back to Larry McMurtry's Leaving Cheyenne. Those fateful, tender, beautiful scenes when one friend loses another. The anger, the not knowing what to do. It's the most powerful scene in the novel. I felt it. That feeling of warmth spread through me as I read the scene, little lump in my throat. And of course, that's the benchmark, listeners. And McCarthy usually hits that benchmark every time. And while it pains me to say it so close to his death, this may be, perhaps, one of his weakest books. Inner. Resources. American Resources. Such a lack Heavy. of gratitude for life. Bored. I, I aspire to boredom, I should say. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. Has you the night sweats and the day sweats, pal? Pal, I do.